a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my fourth uh, Augmented World Expo now. Um, if I could have the clicker, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's my fourth Augmented World Expo, and uh, but the first talk for me and for Siemens Healthcare, especially in a section which is pretty new to everyone, which is education in healthcare and education overall. Um, so I think the education aspect and the education segment, um, as they are pretty new to everyone, it's always a bit of a hard challenge for everyone to understand what are the real challenges and the real approaches that you can head for um, when you're developing applications uh, for this segment. And as healthcare is uh, especially a little bit regulated, as everyone knows here, and I don't know how many people here already developed applications for this, but it's a highly regulated environment. So before we go into the actual content, and I just realized that I have a way darker voice than my previous speakers. I'm sorry for that. Um, before we go into the actual content of the, of the presentation today, um, I want to just give you some, some overview about what Siemens Healthcare is doing and uh, what we're heading for with the education business. So who of you does not know Siemens Healthcare? Thanks so much. Okay, um, good. J just three numbers, basically, which um, I like to highlight on this on this slide. Um, there are way too many on them. Um, the first one is uh, that we have about 240,000 uh, patient touch points every single hour on a day, uh, which means that 240 times an hour, um, a patient is getting affected by our devices and by our modalities, um, which help to provide better patient care um, and to heal diseases. Um, we have about uh, 50,000 employees at that point in time, um, where more than 4,000 are currently working in the education business, and we're represented at um, more than 70 countries. So um, I think for, for also smaller companies which are, which are approaching us and which are developing with us, um, these representations in 70 countries um, is quite an interesting aspect for uh, working with Siemens Healthcare. Now, a bit background to what I'm doing. Um, I actually studied and did my research and still doing my research uh, in human-computer interaction and um, with a dedicated focus on augmented and virtual reality um, since about five to six years now. Um, I had my own company before. I joined Siemens Healthcare in 2016 around. Um, so from a company perspective, I'm a newbie. Um, I'm quite new to that business, um, but this gives a bit of a possibility of um, bringing these new technologies to a business which is very regulated and very well known throughout a lot of years for building modalities. Um, another uh, research focus of myself is um, in the educational sector itself, so measuring education um, through different kinds of sensors, technologies. Um, it could be haptic sensors, it could be virtual reality glasses, eye tracking, whatever. Um, so I'm extremely happy to talk to anyone here, uh, everyone here uh, who's heading into that same direction. Now, if we want to go into the um, analyzing why education is so important, um, especially in the healthcare segment, um, we were facing two major trends um, that came up within the last couple of years. Um, the first trend is that continuing education is extremely critical um, to attract, retain, and engage new talent. Uh, that being said, we, um, this, is, this is a survey from 2018 already. Um, we can say that 87% of millennials, and I'm counting myself to one of them, so I know what I'm talking about there, and I think everyone else here also does, um, are rating professional or career growth and development in their career uh, and opportunities in their career as highly important when going for a new job. And even 59% of them um, want this education opportunity in whatever kind of job they're going in um, whether it is a company like us, whether it is any kind of other company, or even the healthcare sector with hospital chains, nursing schools, everywhere, um, want opportunities to grow and to learn and to be educated in that environment where they are in. The second trend is um, that investing into new technologies, um, like whatever, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, um, and into education with these technologies, um, reduces costs and could definitely increase revenues of different departments. And um, usually I'm not the business person, but I'm also happy to share that one. Um, and how do we try to go to that, um, to, to, this, to this second trend? Um, 
in the US, and um, these numbers are now especially for the US, 25% um, of hospitalized patients are getting harmed by medical errors during their hospital stay, which is quite a big number. So one out of four patients has a problem during their procedures, and that's just way too much. And that's one aspect where education can really be of benefit for you, right? The second topic is um, there are $29 billion of avoidable healthcare costs per year in the US. And if we shrink that number down to um, a medium-sized clinic chain, for example, just 1% engagement in improvement into education would be worth $2 million of saving and operating income, which is quite a big number, I guess. If we sum that up to, um, and this is really for, for medium-sized companies right now, um, if we sum that up, um, and one argument to introduce also other people, other hospitals and uh, universities and schools, um, to introducing education to them, um, is, is, is especially and exactly that number here. And most of the universities and hospitals and schools um, are doing education all their day, right? They're educating their staff, they're educating everyone in their, in their environments. Um, but no one really understands what value and what cost decreases and revenue de increases you could potentially have when you're introducing new ways of educating staff and better ways of educating staff. Now, that being said, um, we can, I think, agree that there is, uh, there is a increasing need for uh, continuous education in the, in the healthcare sector. And education does not necessarily come only with one format, um, like in the medical industry or even when you're studying in, in a university, want to become a doctor, for example. You're having a lot of exams, you're having a lot of lessons, um, you're going through a lot of um, exams through, throughout your whole career, um, and that meaning six years, right? Um, but how could we, and every one of us here, um, increase the continuous education approach uh, with our customers? Um, one of the first things we're looking in is how could we close knowledge gaps? So when you're having a procedure being done um, for yourself or someone else, and I mean having procedures done always means that there's something wrong with your body. Um, closing these knowledge gaps definitely leads to an improvement in diagnostic accuracy. The second aspect is by avoiding um, these unnecessary rescans. And just imagine you're, you're having a CT scan of your head. You're, you had an accident, hopefully you don't, of course. Um, but you're having a CT scan of your head. What happens there is radiation gets emitted. Um, you're getting radiated by that device, which is good. I mean, it's necessary. Um, but let's try to avoid having that a second time, for example. You do not want to over-radiate the patients, and no one wants to get over-radiated. So we want to ensure a perfect a patient experience within um, these new education approaches. And finally, if you're looking to um, the workforce and the way the, uh, the clinics and the hospitals are working, um, underutilized clinical capabilities are a huge problem for hospital chains, for example. And I just want to bring up one example that um, I was astonished about, basically, um, which is here from California. Um, a standard average operating room, so a surgical room, um, where you get your surgical procedure done, um, with the basic equipment costs about $40 a minute. Just a real basic equipment. You put staff costs on top, if you have a high-end room, um, you can get even up to 40,000 bucks um, an hour, which is quite a good number. And imagine every single minute that one person in an OR cannot work because of someone else not being educated well enough or just not being educated on a certain procedure. For example, if you are, if you are a surgeon and um, you are working in, a, in, um, in orthopedics, so uh, you're doing a lot of different procedures on the, on the patient's body, um, you're working with uh, rotating nurses. Um, so every nurse that comes in um, has been assisting in another OR before. It could even happen that during a night shift when there is a lack of staff available, um, that a certain person does not even know about the procedure that has been done and has to learn it right from scratch just before going into that operation. 
And I think none of the patients want that. And I think also the improvement for the workforce productivity in the clinic itself and for the, for the surgeons are one of the real critical values there. And how should we approach it? Um, and that's basically the last thing on this one here. Um, we need to adapt to different kinds of learning styles. Some people prefer, um, and I don't want to bring that age thing up here, um, but some people prefer reading material is the way they want to learn. Some other people prefer having everything on your mobile device. Um, again, other people prefer going to a lecture and having everything explained by certain other people who are really experienced. So adding new technologies here opens up the variety of possibilities um, when you're delivering education to your staff and to your colleagues and to the rest of the organization. But how does um, education actually work here? Um, how, whom of you is in the education business? Oh, still quite some. Okay, that's very good. So you will know that slide, I guess. Um, it's from 1969, so it's pretty old. But not too many things on there changed. Um, and it's basically about how do people actually learn? Um, I've just said, and you can take a picture at the end when it's full, <laughs> um, there are passive and active ways of learning. The passive ways you read, you hear, you see, um, and you combine these two senses. Um, so with reading material and reading newspapers, reading articles, um, you only retain 10% of what you're actually learning there. Some do more, some do less, but 10 is the average in there. You, do, you, you retain 20% of what you hear. So when you're talking to someone else, only 20% of what you're talking to that person is retained in their brain and they keep remembering it. 30% um, of what you see, so what do you do? You start combining senses. Um, and by, by combining seeing and hearing, um, you can reach up to 50% of knowledge retention throughout your conversation or throughout what you're trying to learn. But then there's also the active way. And the active way is what we're all looking in here, right? Um, we're saying things out loud. Imagine when you were back in your, in your um, curriculum, um, everyone said you have to listen, you have to read, but you also have to talk about what you're doing. So interaction is highly important. And ideally, if you have the chance, you need to talk to the people and you need to help them and support them and do actual, actual real work on, for example, patients. And on the right side there, you just, you just have a couple of technologies. Um, I'm still calling a book a technology, yes. Um, a couple of technologies that are uh, being attached to the different ways of learning. You're reading books, you're listening to lectures, you're integrating all these um, learning objectives into a learning management system. You sometimes even use flashcards. But the way where you really are learning and where you retain your knowledge is in real life job situ uh, shadowing, for example, or actually providing care to patients. So the earlier we can move that step from actual contact to a patient, the earlier we can deliver a better and more retainable way of education to the people who are being educated. Now, when you look at the education path, and we're slowly but constantly coming to the technical points, um, the education path starts pretty early, right? Um, you're being educated from really early childhood on, even before birth. You're listening, you're feeling, and these two senses are the senses that are mostly being affected when you're still not born. After you're born, your main um, sense of absorbing information and of learning is through your visual impression. So you're looking at everything, you're trying to feel everything, you're trying to grab everything, you're trying to listen a lot, that's also how you learn, for example, to speak. When we're moving ahead in the education in school, that's basically the first time when someone else you don't know that well, like a teacher, like a professor later in the university, for example, is starting to deliver education to you where someone else thinks you need that education. And you're starting to go into a certain career path, for example. So you're starting your professional career somewhere in the education in school and in high school or in university. And I'm from Germany, it's a bit different there. Um, but I'm more talking about the universities now. And you're coming to a certain point when you reach your professional um, career. And in the professional career, um, education just does not stop. Even if everyone says, yes, I'm now not being educated anymore in school. Um, but your education moves on throughout your whole professional career and you're basically learning until 
the end. You're absorbing information, you're trying to build up on that information, and you're trying to retain that information all the time to keep up and running and to learn more things, but also to retain what you have learned before. If we would put that in a, in a diagram, and that's basically where our challenges start. And as the talk said, I, I'm trying to put some challenges and approaches on, so, on solutions to these challenges. Um, I've separated it down there into um, these three segments here. So you have your preschool segment, you have your undergraduate segment, and you have your professional career, which is usually the longest time, hopefully. Um, throughout these career paths and times, um, you have these two major milestones when you are going to school, going away from home, spending more time in school, and when you're going to, to your professional career. When entering these certain milestones, um, the amount of information that you can share with people and the amount of information that will be consumed by the people um, is getting less and less because the people need more professional and more dedicated information and education throughout their time. So a super trivial picture basically, um, but that's one of the mo most critical challenges currently. Which segment do you want to face with the product that you're targeting for education, that you're targeting maybe for the, um, for the, for the healthcare sector or even for other sectors? At which point in time do you want to deliver that education to the actual trainee? Most of the applications I'm, I'm now um, confronted with in, in AR and VR um, are also targeting the undergraduate segment. A lot of them are going into, into the student segment, trying to educate students, trying to educate um, in schools, in nursing schools. The variety of applications there is still relatively big. But the later you get into the professional segment, and now if we're talking about surgery, for example, which is one of the most critical and most interesting and amazing things in healthcare, where you can deliver education to, there are not too many surgeons. And these surgeons need a very, very specific way of education to improve their knowledge even further because they are so highly specialized in what they're doing that the education they get delivered, and we saw the example of OsoVR before, um, where uh, a needle is placed into a knee for a knee um, fracture replacement and a knee fracture reconstruction. Um, these are highly specific use cases, and in these highly specific use cases, certain technologies can make sense. And now the question is, which technologies do make sense there? And I think every single presentation has to contain at least one slide with uh, big buzzwords. Um, so that's my big buzzword slide. Um, and I will not go to every one of them. Um, but the technology challenge is always which kind of technology do I use, but especially which kind of use case do I want to refer it to. Also, a lot of companies I've talked to so far um, some still exist, some don't, unfortunately. Um, they had a very blurry use case for their application and for their usage of technology. The better you can define your use case and the better you can define the path and the point and the path of the education of a certain person, um, the better you can adapt the technologies to it and the better you can also argument why these technologies are really fitting to this. And here I just want to give you some, some um, examples. I'll just do them by word um, because my colleagues were uh, struggling giving me um, the slides for this. Um, but for example, in the, in the technical training section now. Uh, we heard a lot about technical training, about technical onboarding, um, technical support in, these, in this conference already. Uh, we can, or we are already using uh, technologies for technical trainings, for example, on our equipment. So simulating a CT scanner, for example, putting a virtual reality headset on your head, um, channeling the people through a simulation of the CT scanner, and training them on, for example, how to disassemble and reassemble this device for a technical support. There the use case is, um, our staff, our, or our technical support staff, has to be educated that well that they can respond within 24 hours for any kind of, uh, any kind of um, demolition on the, on the device, for example. So if there's a tube defect um, in one of our devices, the person who has to repair it has to precisely know what the error is, of course, as, as well as in other industries, um, but also has to be there on a, in a certain time. And one of the parts we can deliver this education to, um, and we can do it globally. So we do not have to put all the people to a training center, for example, like we do it at the moment. We have three global training centers. Um, one is in Erlangen, Shanghai, and uh, one more here in the US. 
um, where we bring all the people there, educate them, further educate them on the actual physical equipment, but how could we deliver that education also in the virtual reality space? There are a lot of use cases for this. Then if we're talking about remote guidance, um, there we're currently setting up a project with, um, with the support of Help Lightning. Um, I think someone is here. Um, they are delivering a super simple and easy to use application for remote assistance. And there the challenge is, do we really need augmented reality from the first beginning on? Are the technicians able to absorb this information and to handle this kind of a techn technology at the moment? Maybe they are, some are not. But how could we deliver this way of new um, technical support to every single one of them? And that could be, for example, through a screen sharing application, kind of a Skype-like application with, um, with uh, little markovers over certain areas where you can draw in, where you can point information to, and some augmented reality features. We're going into the sales and uh, sales enablement and planning, for example. Uh, this is one of the most amazing topics for me, and this was already released on, uh, on the last RSNA, which is the biggest conference for us. Um, it is a tool where you can plan customer sites in. So it's a Unity developed tool. Um, we have all our modalities in there, and you can adjust all the modalities, tow walls up, set doors and everything, and you can measure distances between certain areas in this environment and you can then visualize it in virtual reality, which is in there a feature currently, um, but this is what really affects the people because the customers are for the first time able to see their, their building before it's actually assembled. And this is also what we call education. One last example here um, is about simulating radiology training environments. This I'm not able to show here, but uh, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so imagine a scenario where um, a radiologist or a technician who is supporting in an OR um, environment is not only learning the way the equipment works and not only learning the way you handle a patient, but also learning all the single workflow steps in between. So in virtual reality or with the use of virtual reality and one backend system and a bit of um, e-learning activities, we can now deliver this education in a full-blown package with all the different modules to the actual user and enable them to go through a full path of education within that virtual environment. And now basically coming to the last challenge, um, which is one of the most challenging ones actually, is how do we scale that whole thing up? So once we have developed or someone else has developed an application um, with us for us for someone else. Um, how do we actually scale it, and scaling meaning in a global pace? When we are trying to adopt a new technology or a new use case and we try to scale it, um, we have these 70 country organizations um, which are active in each of the different regions. How do you bring an ed educational piece that is, for example, developed in Germany or in the US for a certain education curriculum how do you bring that one to other education sections on the whole globe? We have a couple of challenges here. Um, for one of them is, for example, the, the educational system is varying a lot across the globe. If you're educating in Germany, um, we have a pretty, pretty straight education system like it is also in the US here. Um, but if you want to bring that same educational value to a region like deep India, for example, China, somewhere else, um, you will face challenges because of certifications, because of um, the actual educational system, because of a shorter duration on the ed educational time a person spends in education and in school, and you have to adapt your product to this. So you finally do not have a three years duration curriculum like you have in Germany, but you only have one year. How do you fit all that, st all that content that you want to deliver in three years in Germany, how do you fit it into a one year curriculum in another country? Theoretically, it's possible, but that's one of the largest challenges. We're talking about individual certification requirements in different countries. Um, here we have the FDA, in Germany we have the TÜV, in other countries we have other regulation environments and regulatories uh, where we have to follow um, that are providing the necessary um, security for everyone who's using the software. And if we are providing, for example, training um, to a medical equipment, we're also, the training is a medical equipment. You have different job definitions in, in the countries, but also the cultural differences. And that's, again, one point I want to really highlight here. When you're talking to, um, to some Western country, 
um, you're having some completely different understanding on, on, the, on the technology, for example. If you're bringing um, a virtual reality headset with a high-end computer, which is about worth 2,500 bucks maybe, if you're bringing that to a country which usually cannot afford this, how can you ensure that they even know how to use it? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but that's one of the other challenges. Plus, um, and that one's I like the most, um, we have to enable our own organization. When you're talking to an organization which is usually selling equipment, which is in the areas of millions usually, how do you enable an organization to sell educational pieces and educational software which are the size of maybe $500 a user? How do you enable the sales that are in the different regions? How do you enable your individual countries on really selling and pitching these products also to potential customers and also to potential users? That being said, I have 20 seconds left. I hope still 10 minutes to go. Um, I hope I could give you a little bit of an insight on what we're thinking this kind of education brings to us and we could also bring to, the, uh, to our customers and also to the patient. And I mean, our goal is uh, to enable and to extend the patient experience as much as possible. From a technology point of view, my goal is um, I want to bring these technologies into the healthcare sector. And um, for that one, I'm happy to connect to everyone here. Um, now my, oh, there it is. Um, I'm happy to connect to everyone here. And the good thing is whenever you have a question or a product or um, some aspects that you might think that are necessary for the healthcare sector and that you wanna bring in here, um, it's not only me in there. Um, we have a whole community, which we call the all sorts of reality community. Um, where we have representatives of each single business line, MR, CT, all the modalities, all the service infrastructure. So we will definitely find a peer to talk to um, in our organization. Thank you very much. <laughs>